Trolley to Yesterday by John Belairs, Chapter 5. Johnny sneaked back into his house that night without being spotted. When he met Fergie after school the next day, they talked about their adventure, which was already beginning to seem like something they had dreamed. That evening, the professor came back from his trip, and the boys wondered if he had noticed that anything was wrong. When they talked to him, he did not give any sign that he was upset, but the next afternoon, Johnny noticed a locksmith truck was parked in front of the professor's house. Grandpa said the professor was having his front and back door locks changed. Johnny's heart sank. The next time he visited the professor for a chess game, he, bra he braced himself for a bawling out, but none came. The professor was his usual cranky but kindly self, and he had baked a chocolate cake, which was as delicious as always. Once or twice, Johnny glanced at the old man across the chessboard. He thought he saw a sly smile as if the professor was enjoying some private joke. A week passed, and nothing very exciting happened. Johnny got an A on an algebra test, and the kite-flying season began out at the Dunstan Heights athletic field. Johnny and Fergie studied together a lot because there was a big history test coming up, and half the kids in their class were scared to death of failing it. Johnny and Fergie were both pretty good at history, so they weren't really very worried, but they hit the books anyway because they enjoyed being together. Sometimes they went to the movies after they had finished doing their homework, and as they walked home, they always stopped near the professor's house and looked to see if the basement light was on. Sometimes it was, and sometimes it wasn't. The professor was being more friendly these days, but he still acted secretive, and this was exasperating to the boys. Let's wait till he makes his move, Fergie said, and he said it often. At first, this advice sounded good to Johnny, but gradually he began to realize that Fergie wasn't making sense. He told him so one afternoon when they were gobbling hot fudge sundaes at Peter's sweet shop. "'What good is it going to do for us to wait?' Johnny asked irritably. "'If he decides to zoom off for Constantinople and save those people from the Turks, we'll never know till he's gone.' Fergie smiled knowingly and held up his dripping spoon. "'Ah, that's where you're wrong, John Baby,' he said. "'That's where you're wrong. He's got to get some. He's got to get together some equipment.' Johnny was mystified. "'Equipment? What do you mean?' Fergie's grin grew wider. "'I mean a gun, John Baby!' You don't really believe all that stuff about how he wouldn't use a machine gun on the Turks, did you? Johnny could feel his face growing red. If you really want to know, Fergie, he said angrily, yes, I do believe what the professor says. He hates guns. Yeah, yeah, sure, sneered Fergie, waving his hand scornfully at Johnny. Look, kid, the prof is a little nutty, but he isn't all that, Fergie's voice trailed away. He had seen something out of the corner of his eye. The two of them were sitting in a booth near the front of the shop, and Fergie had caught sight of the professor's car through the big display window. Hey, he said excitedly, hey, John Baby, look at that. The prof's going down the street, and I'll bet you he's going to the Merrimack Sporting Goods shop to buy a rifle. How much you want to bet? Johnny winced. He didn't like gambling, but Fergie had just declared war. All right, he said hotly, I'll bet you 50 cents he isn't buying a gun. You're on, said Fergie and he slapped Johnny's hand to seal the bet. The two boys finished their ice cream quickly, paid at the counter, and hurried out. The Merrimack Sporting Goods shop was about a block and a half down the street, and they walked slowly on the side of the street that was across from the shop so the professor wouldn't notice them. By the time Fergie and Johnny got there, the professor had parked his car and gone in. Johnny peered at the display window that was full of shotguns, rifles, and target pistols. His heart sank, and he began to think maybe Fergie was right. Minutes passed. The two boys crouched behind a pickup truck and waited to see what the professor was going to bring out of the store. As the minutes ticked by on Johnny's watch, he wondered what on earth the old man was doing. Finally, the professor came out, and the owner of the shop was with him. They were carrying a large, rubber, inflatable life raft, the kind that comes with a paddle and a cylinder of compressed air, wrapped up with luggage straps. "'Oh, my gosh!' said Fergie as he put his hand over his face. "'He's going to try to get to Constantinople in that thing!' He'll drown himself, that's for sure. Johnny was very alarmed. He had won his bet with Fergie, but that didn't matter for, to him now. What they had just seen was proof that the professor was going to try to get into the walled city. Once he was inside, what was he going to do? The boys didn't have the foggiest idea. They knew the professor wanted to save the people who were trapped inside the great church of the Holy Wisdom, but they didn't know how. The whole idea seemed crazy and harebrained. Johnny was afraid the old man would get himself killed or disappear forever into the past. With the owner's help, the professor lashed the rubber raft to the top of his car. As he drove off, Fergie stood up and let out a low, long whistle. <whistles> Boy, he said, folding his arms in disgust, ain't that something. He's going to go back there and try to scare away 
those Turks with his Knights of Columbus sword. I really didn't think he was that wacky. Fergie, said Johnny in a low, serious voice, we've got to stop him, otherwise he's going to get himself killed. Relax, John, baby, said Fergie soothingly. Byron Q. Ferguson always comes up with some clever idea that will save the day. Johnny glanced at him skeptically. Oh, yeah? Like what? Fergie shrugged. I haven't thought of it yet, but give me some time. Just give me a little bit of time, and I'll figure out what to do. Maybe they had time, maybe they didn't. For all the boys knew, the professor might be planning to zoom off to Constantinople that very night. If he did, what could they do? Not much, and they knew it. April violets sprang up as the days passed, and mild breezes blew. Every morning, as he got ready for the long walk to school, Johnny glanced across the street to see if the professor was getting his car out of the garage. Usually, he had eight o'clock classes at Hagstrom College, and if he wasn't in too big a hurry, he would offer Johnny a ride. On mornings, when he saw the car backing out, Johnny heaved a sigh of relief. But if the car stayed in the garage, he fussed and fretted. Was the professor in his house, or had he gone back to a world long ago to carry out an impossible plan? By the time a week had passed, Johnny was convinced that the professor would be making his move soon. He and Fergie had better get busy and figure out a way to stop him. One cold, drizzly evening toward the middle of April, Johnny and Fergie were playing chess in the parlor of the Dixon's house. They sat at the table that was drawn up near the big bay window, and they were both having a lot of trouble keeping their minds on the game. Every now and then, one of them would glance quickly at the dark house across the street. There was a light on in the study window upstairs. That probably meant that the professor was grading papers. Unless, of course, he had left a light on up there to confuse them while he was poking around in the dark down in the cellar. The lights in the old subway tunnel couldn't be seen from outside, so he couldn't be getting so he could be getting ready to go, for all they knew. Johnny moved to Bishop and then peered out across the window and then peered again out the window. When Fergie saw the move the move his friend had made, he laughed. Come on, Johnny O. Give it up, he said, and shoved Johnny's king over to the so over onto the side. You're not paying any attention to this game, and neither am I. We ought to just go over there with a ha and hammer on the door and yell, Hey, Prof, what's up? Or something like that. Johnny grimaced. Oh, sure, he said sourly. That'd be just a that that'd be just an A number one fine idea. We wouldn't get anywhere if we did that. He'd just pretend he didn't know what we were talking about, or else he'd give us that routine about how he goes to the tower to stand and look at the city. If he ever does try to save those people in Constantinople, he, he'll go there at 3 a.m. and we'll never know anything about it till he gets back. If he does get back, Fergie set his jaw. He looked grim and determined. I hate to admit it, but I think you're right, he muttered. So I guess there's only one thing to do. We have to fix it so the prof can't leave the tower. With a wicked grin, Fergie reached into his hip pocket and pulled out a switchblade knife with a black bone handle. He touched a button and a long glittering blade flew out with a snicking sound. Johnny was stunned. Fergie often dressed like a leather jacket hood, but he had never carried a knife before, not as far as Johnny knew anyway. Fergie, he whispered in a shocked voice. For gosh sakes, put that thing away. If my grandma sees you with that, she'll toss you out on your ear. Why did you bring that along? With a frown, Fergie folded the knife up and stuck it back in his pocket. Don't get yourself in an uproar, John baby, he said softly. I just want to use this thing to cut some nice big holes in the prof's rack so he can't use it. Doesn't that seem like a good idea to you? Johnny thought for a bit. Yeah, I guess so, he said slowly. But what if he takes the raft out in the water and it sinks under him and he drowns? How do you think we'll feel then? Fergie grinned maliciously. Ah, he'll never get to the water with that raft. I'm going to cut so many holes in it that it'll look like a big yellow Swiss cheese. He'll just have to climb into the trolley and come on back home. Come on, we'll scoot over there and do a little sabotage. Johnny was silent. Fergie's plan bothered him. It was too much like a high, like high school vandalism, slashing tires and stuff like that. On the other hand, he knew that they had to do something to stop the professor from getting from going on his disastrous mission. At last, he heaved a deep sigh and pushed his chair back. Oh, okay, he said, as he shoved himself out of his chair. Let's go over there and see what we can do. But remember that my key won't fit his front door lock anymore, and I'll bet that and I'll bet you that the front door and the back door are both fastened up tighter than a drum. I'll bet they are, said Fergie with a knowing smile. But I wasn't going to try and get in through the doors. There's a, there's four or five cellar windows over there, and probably one of them is loose. Let's go see. Johnny frowned doubtfully, but he followed Fergie out into the front hall. From the dining room came the sound of the baseball game that Grandpa was listening to. 
Grandma was upstairs, closing the front door softly behind them. The boys trotted across the porch, down the steps, and across the street. Without hesitating, they ran around to the rear of the professor's house and plunged into the wet bushes that grew close to the, store, to the stone foundation. Kneeling down, Fergie began to push at one of the cobwebbed cellar windows. It was stuck tight, and immediately Johnny's heart sank, but Fergie did not give up easily. He moved along to the second window and gave it a hard bang with the heel of his hand. With a squeak and a rattle, it swung inward. See, Fergie whispered, what I tell you? Now get, out, get down on your hands and knees and follow me. Johnny wanted to complain about the muddy ground that would get his pants all dirty, but he knew that Fergie would make fun of him, so he said nothing. He watched as his friend turned over onto his belly and slid feet first in through the narrow opening. Johnny hesitated. He really didn't like what they were doing. Come on, Fergie called with a loud, in a loud whisper. What are you waiting for, Christmas? With a long, deep sigh, Johnny took off his glasses and put them into the holder in his shirt pocket. Carefully, he lowered himself over the worn sill of the cellar window. It was pitch black down below, and when his feet hit, Johnny felt loose objects rolling around under him. Then he remembered this was the window that led to the coal bin. Lots of nice, dirty coal, Fergie said with a giggle. Your grandma will love the way you look when you get back home. Johnny winced, but he followed Fergie out of the coal bin and past the looming shadow of the furnace. Gradually, their eyes got used to the darkness, and they moved across the cellar floor toward the tunnel. They could see a pale gleam coming from the archway. They knew that something was up. Wait, Fergie whispered, and he put his hand on Johnny's chest. We have to go really slow from here on. Tiptoeing softly, the boys began to make their way toward the glimmering brick passageway. They plastered their bodies against the rough wall and inched slowly along sideways. The light at the far end grew brighter, and they could see the little red and green trolley car sitting on its rusty tracks. The shadow of a head bobbed behind the dusty windows, and in an instant the boys knew that their worst fears were true. The professor was getting ready to take the trolley on a trip back through time. As they stood motionless, watching an electrical hum, as they stood motionless, watching an electrical hum filled the tunnel. The car shimmered like something seen through a rain-splattered window. There wasn't time to decide what to do. Both boys bolted forward and ran toward the little gilded balcony on the rear of the car. The humming rose to an ear-splitting screech as the boys clattered up the metal steps and threw themselves face down on the rigid steel platform. A howling wind sprang up and the car shook violently. The trolley lurched forward and Johnny clutched frantically at the floor, trying to get a handhold. A babble of confused voices filled his ears, and he felt his body was turning to sand, falling to pieces. Oh no, oh no, oh no, he kept saying over and over, and he hoped that he would lose consciousness, but he didn't, and the roaring, jolting ride went on. And that's the end of chapter five.